In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. The verses that we hear this morning from the 22nd chapter of St. Matthew are comprised of one of Christ's parables, that in which he compares the kingdom of heaven to a great marriage feast. Christ says that the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. The king, we are told, sent forth his servants to invite certain people to the wedding feast, but none responded at all. The king sent his servants a second time. In this time, the servants told those invited of the wonderful things that had been prepared for the feast. Again, however, no one came. But instead, the people gave excuses that they were too busy with the farm and with the business to attend the feast. Then some of these men even seized hold of the servants and murdered them. The enraged king, quite understandably, sent his army to punish and to destroy the murderers. The king then sent his servants out into the highways to bring in strangers so that there would be guests for the wedding and for the feast. Finally, the king saw a man at the feast who had failed to wear the proper garment and challenged by the king as to why he was there without a wedding garment. The man remained silent. The king had him bound up and thrown into the outer darkness. What lessons are we to draw from this morning's parable? St. Gregory the Diologist writes that the king is God himself, and the marriage is symbolic of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the union of Christ's divine and human natures into one person. The feast is symbolic of Christ's church, which exists, remember, both in heaven and on earth. St. John Chrysostom's commentary is similar to this interpretation. He adds that at first, Christ invites the people of the Old Covenant, the Jews, to join this great marriage feast, which is the Church. But they fail to respond. He invites them a second time, and they are too busy with earthly concerns, to which St. John Chrysostom states that when spiritual things call us, There is no press of business that has the power of necessity. When Christ persists with his invitation to the Jews, they kill him, they crucify him, just as they killed the Old Testament prophets. St. John comments that Christ sought to win them over before his crucifixion, and even after it, he still urges them, striving to win them over. However, they refused him, And so it is, then, that ordinary people of the highways, the Gentiles, are invited since the wedding feast, the church, must be filled. St. John writes that when the Jews were not willing to be present at the marriage, then he called others. He called you, and he called me. You will remember that in the parable, when the king's servants are killed, the king sends forth an army to destroy their city and to punish them. So it was, St. John writes, that less than four decades after Christ's ascension, Jerusalem fell. Jerusalem was utterly destroyed, and the people there killed or dispersed to the four corners of the earth. Now Christ, as I said, has summoned us to his feast, that is, to his church so that here we may partake of his sacred foods, those that are filled with grace, the holy mysteries, or sacraments, and that prepare us spiritually for eternal life. For life in that eternal aspect of the church. But for this feast we must prepare. We must attire ourselves with the proper garment, or we shall be cast like the man in the parable into the outer darkness. The garment is, of course, a spiritual one. Without it, without preparing ourselves for the wedding feast, we are no better, no better 
than those who rejected and crucified Christ. Since failure to prepare ourselves is a form of rejection, it is a gross insult to the king. And therefore, our ultimate fate, too, in the life to come, will be no better. Now, how do we apply that which we read in this morning's gospel lesson to our daily lives, and how do we assure that our wedding garment is proper to the occasion of our meeting with the king? We are so blessed by God to be members of his church. We have been invited to partake of the feast, and we have accepted the invitation. When we attend the divine liturgy, we share in the feast that the King, Christ Jesus, has readied for us. And in doing this, we prepare ourselves for an eternal feast in the life to come. St. Gregory the Diologist, also known as Pope Gregory I, again writes that the wedding garment symbolizes the virtue of charity. We prepare ourselves to meet our King and God by developing within ourselves this virtue of charity, because at the end, at its highest development, all of the other spiritual virtues come down to this. They aim towards this. Those who will be saved are those who acquire selfless love, a love that does not aim at selfish ends. St. Gregory says, referring again to the wedding garment, that cloth is woven between two beams, an upper and a lower. Any of you who have ever woven cloth know that this is true. In like fashion is our spiritual garment woven. St. Gregory tells us with an upper beam, which is love of God, and a lower beam, which is love of neighbor. One must love God with his whole soul, heart, and strength. It must be total, in other words. As for love of neighbor, St. Gregory says this, let no one, when he loves someone, think to himself that he now begins to possess charity until he first examines the motives of his love. For if one loves another but does not love him for God's sake, he has not charity, but only thinks he has. But when we love our friend in God and our enemy because of God, this is true charity. We love for God's sake those whom we know do not love us. Charity is proved true solely by means of its opposite, hate. And so because of this, the Lord himself says to us, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. We then love securely those whom we know do not love us. And these are great precepts, exclaims St. Gregory, sublime precepts and are too many hard to fulfill. Nevertheless, this is the wedding garment. And whoever sits down at the wedding feast without it, let him watch with fear. For when the king comes in, he shall be cast forth. We may add by way of clarification that the selfless love of which the gospel speaks, and to which St. Gregory here refers, is only possible by the cultivation of all the other Christian virtues, and by obedience to all of the other commandments of God. Men and women who come to the feast, who come to the divine liturgy, with hate in their hearts, do not wear the acceptable garment. Men and women whose faith and love are cold, who attend church for social reasons or for numerous other reasons not consistent with the love of God, are, spiritually speaking, not dressed in a wedding garment pleasing to the King, Christ Jesus. We must come to the feast to the divine liturgy, for the sake of the glory of him who invited us, not for our own glory. Christ ends his parable with the pronouncement, many are called, but few are chosen. Saint Paul tells us that God desires that all men be saved. God loves every human being with the same intensity of love and wishes that all may come to him. So, many are called. However, it is in the very nature of God's glory that only those who have purified themselves and acquired selfless love may spend eternity with him, that is, to partake of the eternal feast. That is because only those men and women who have acquired the means to receive the boundless love that radiates from God 
what theologians call God's energies, can live in eternal bliss. He chooses only those men and women, only those who have acquired some measure of selfless love, and that number is small by comparison with the total. Few, indeed, are chosen. In St. Gregory's discourse on this gospel lesson, he also mentions a man who had failed to prepare himself for eternal life. On his deathbed, near the end of his life, this man could see the demons preparing to take him to their abode of eternal sufferings, and he saw himself literally being swallowed by a hideous creature, that is, the beast, Satan himself. But his brethren, who loved him despite his sinfulness, prayed for him around his deathbed for his salvation, and God in his mercy granted the man a brief reprieve for a few days so that he could repent of his sins and win eternal happiness with God. It would be a mistake, of course, for any of us to count on such circumstances at the hour of our death, for none of us know how we shall die and whether we shall be granted sufficient time to repent, to turn our lives around. Death, as we know, takes many people in an instant. But the point here is that God's mercy is wondrous, and that is not too late. Whatever the circumstances of our lives, however old or young we are, however rich or poor we are, we can begin now to prepare our wedding garments for that encounter with the King that every one of us will someday experience. Let us wait no longer. How many of us will be alive tomorrow, or the next day, or the next week? We do not know. Now is the time to begin weaving our garments to begin loving God with our whole soul and heart and strength, and to begin loving our neighbors as ourselves. Now is the time to seek that selfless love, to put on that spotless wedding garment that will save us. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to